everyone. Uh, welcome to our, our webinar. This is another episode of our bi-weekly webinar. We try to educate fellow syndicators and also investors on different aspects of real assets investing. Uh, today, we're going to be talking mainly about different components of a GP team. And if you have any of these puzzle piece missing, you're going to have trouble executing. This is the uh, very important uh, piece of the puzzle. So I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Pasan Yat. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician, also a real asset syndicator, um, also CEO of Dr. BDZ Capital. We have about 1,030 uh, doors under management in multifamily. We also do self-storages, oil and gas, about 143 million under management. So, you know, it's very exciting to do this webinar. We also learn a lot as we are touching the topic. We also get some few aspects of it that we're like, man, we need to brush up this area. So let's George introduce himself and then we get started. Hi hey guys, hey again, welcome back and welcome to any new faces. I'm Dr. George Ozude. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and a real asset syndicator as well, based out of Houston, Texas. And I've been investing both as an LP for over 25 deals over six years now, and now into my co-GP career with three deals. I'm the CEO of Time Health Capital. We invest across a multiple of different assets, including multifamily, of course, residential, medical office building, farmland agriculture, oil and gas through mineral rights. And so my experience has led me to a portfolio of about 500 units as a co-GP, totaling about 50 million of assets under management. As an LP, I've, de I've deployed about 1.5 million in capital. And so this has been a, a great real estate and real asset journey for me. And I'm really excited to connect with you guys again tonight and try to bring value through education. Okay. With that, I'll kick it back to bio. Awesome. Awesome, man. I had to work on my intro. <laughs> Great one. George. So we're going to just talk about breakdown on the roles, like common roles of the GP team. We also like to take people behind the closed door in the you know, back of the curtain to say on what happened at the GP level. Because what many investors uh, don't know is how does the split happen, right? Behind the closed door, right? There's 70-30 split oftentimes. They say 70% to the LP and 30% to, to the GP. But what happens to that 30%? So that's where the team dynamics uh, occurs. So I'm going to share some something. Let's say share screen. So this is from Michael, Michael oh, Blanks. Michael. You can do this in many ways, right? You could split this in... You can divide this into, instead of five pieces, you can break it into 10 pieces if you like, right? But this is just a typical, just to let you understand how this works. Normally, when you do the deal, that 30% is further split up among all the team members. And based on what everyone does, that's how you do this split. And we're going to, as we're talking, you're going to understand why some of this is split this way. So, for example, the acquisition person who will bring the contracts, source it, do the diligence and closing. So depending on how much of this you do or how much of the partner does, that determines what oftentimes if there's two partners, you both do you no. Know, you find a way to determine how much work each one of you does so that you could without having to argue too much on that somebody did more work than the other one. So we have the sourcing, sourcing risk capital, which is essentially the earnest money, right? So oftentimes you as the managing partner or the managing partners will put this money down, but there will be a situation where we have a huge deal, like $50 million deal. And my, our net worth is, you know, it's not up to that yet. So we need an outside person to come do that. You know, with especially with the balance sheet guarantee, right? And and sometimes it will be two percent of the deal. So if you're doing like a hundred million dollar deal, 
you might have to just put two two million dollars down, right? As NS money. So it gets expensive pretty quick. And then raising capital. And many of these are negotiable, right? Especially for some over here, like Temi, capital raising, right? Uh Chuku. Uh, you guys, you can be like, okay, if I'm gonna be bringing 50% of the money, I want 35, I want 40. So it just depends. And shit guarantors are just people that they have big uh, net worth, high net worth, right? So you always need someone with such a high net worth on your team, or at least you have access to them that, you know, but you give them a cut of the deal. So this is just the general. And then this 15%, I'll say, you know, you can allocate different things to them, but we keep it mainly for that purpose of if we need to add more to different sections of this. If, if somebody said, look, I'm going to bring all the money you need, but I want 35 or 40%, it might just be worth it for you to save time and energy and just say, you know what, <laughs> you can have it. And then we don't have to worry about raising the capital. The deal can just go through straight. Oh, so yeah, I can say from like anecdotes, just to give personal touches to this, I've seen firsthand how different it can be. These are general rules, just to reiterate. When one deal, I've seen where it's more this industry standard where the capital raisers, whether it be one person or it be five people, they will split that 30% versus in maybe let's say a bigger deal where the capital, the amount of capital that one, any one person brings is naturally larger because it's a bigger deal. There's a bigger down payment. There's a bigger capital raise. Now that inherently makes it more valuable to that lead operator. I've seen it in a deal where one person uh, or one group, one capital raising group bought 75% of the deal, not even a hundred percent of the capital raise, but that was such a high amount, which was about 15, 16, $17 million check that they were able to command a hundred percent of that 30%, even though there was other, or excuse me, 50% of the equity, meaning instead of 30, they got to 50% of the equity just because they brought such a big check even despite it not being all of the capital that was needing to be raised. But it's, it really depends on where that lead operator is finding the most value. If that lead operator is fairly good at capital raising, maybe they're not going to give as much percentage on that capital, on that capital raiser. But if the lead operator is just great at everything else, but they really want to find someone else to raise capital. Yeah. And it's a big enough deal. They can, that can change. So it's, not hard and fast rules. They're just general guidelines. Helps when these guidelines, because it's good to know if you're on the capital raising side or you're KP, which is the balance sheet guarantor, where to start having discussions and talking about these numbers. And you're not just way off, either underselling yourself or asking for some crazy um, percentage. So you're not looking inexperienced. So I think these are no good general uh, numbers to learn and know that there's some wiggle room above and below. Yeah, absolutely. If you basically, if you have big checks, or if you're having trouble getting a balance sheet guarantor, right? You're doing such a big deal that your net worth for that, usually your net worth has to be equivalent to how much you actually borrowed. So if you're doing a $50 million deal and you have to lend $40 million and your net worth is like 10, so you absolutely need someone with $30 million. So they might be able to say, I want 30% and there may not be anything you could do about it. So if you really want the deal to go through, you just have to put it through your underwriting to make sure that it makes sense or just grab, grab this thing and drop it on there, you know? So another thing is you can be on multiple section of this. I actually am notorious for being in every single section. So oftentimes I'll do, okay, fine. I'll help with the due diligence and the closing. So I get like this a percentage. You may not be... 50, it might be 10, it might be 30% based on how much of it you do. And the risk capital, every single GP, we tend to all put something down. So oftentimes this would be watered down to be like, if there's four of us, it would be like three, 4% or, or so, you know, each. And uh, raising the capital, you know, by nature of being the CEO, I tend to raise capital by just sending my emails out. So usually you grab a little bit of portion of that too. And balance sheet guarantor, I, I 
guarantee as much as I can with my network. And then, and that's it. So I'm going to stop here and move to the other part of it. So any questions so far? Just, just to always mention that specifically with capital raising, that percentage gets determined in a very structured way such that it doesn't break any SEC compliance rules. You can't directly get compensated for the amount that you raise. And so it's very specific rules that have to be followed. A lot of times those agreements of those percentage splits are determined ahead of time. And that doesn't happen always, but that for in the space, but we always perform those specific structures, those specific steps to do it each way, each, the same way each time and remain in compliance. As folks get out there and start testing out their GP skills and doing some capital raising, always keep that in mind. There's SEC compliance rules to, to abide by. Yeah, absolutely. Because I always, that's what my lawyer told me. He said, with IRS, you can negotiate. Okay. So IRS is basically a negotiating <laughs> situation. But with SEC, it's just straight to jail. <laughs> so there's no negotiation whatsoever. So, you know, so basically just saying, just know which part you can move, <laughs> you know, so basically which one you can push the limit on. So not with SEC, absolutely. So, so I have a question. Yeah. Do you guys use an SEC attorney? Yes, we do. Okay. And we do have two that we know for sure be good. We use one called Polymath. I can send the information to you. And then there's the syndication attorneys. Actually, that's their name. Sure. <laughs> and they have and like, then, yeah. So and then for me, I'm in my syndication mentoring club. There's an SEC attorney that we use. And I can share his information. He's pretty well known influencer in the space as well. He puts out a lot of contact content. His name is Mauricio Rald. And so I, I have the opportunity to pick his brain about SEC stuff every now and then. He's fairly well known and trusted. Yeah, great. So, That'd be awesome. Yeah, it's take your pick. You can always try each one for different deals and then you find your the price is similar. It will be five thousand in between. But I'll say just be ready for between twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars in general to get the deal through. Okay, so now going on to the uh, members of the team, I'm going to talk about the first two, which is the managing partner or principal. With syndication, it's very the uh, people use terms very loosely a lot. Co GP, the syndicator, who is the managing partner, principal. So many of them which is slight variation, but they essentially mean the main person. Who is the person putting all of this together, right? For me, if it's, there are some deals which we partner with lead operators, and there are some which we do the deals on our own. So the deals that we do, I bring to the market, then that's me as the managing partner, the main one or the principal. So this is person that oversee the operations and strategy of the syndication. You also lead investor relations discussion with different of the team. You do uh, part of the deal sourcing and also the negotiation efforts, right? So if the acquisition guy send me a deal, I ultimately have to say yes, right? Before the deal goes through, even though they find the deal is the best deal. So, you know, you just know that you're the main one. And then you provide direction for asset management. Whether you are doing the asset management yourself, or somebody, or you hire someone to do it. And same thing with property management. So you're going to be the one to, you know, put the final, you show up every week or every other week, you do every week for unstabilized assets and every other week for stabilized assets, right? So you meet up, you know, at least one hour, I would probably say a week if you're just getting started, you know, so to go through everything with the property manager and then decide what to do. So. Uh, so that's it about that managing principle. That one is, is relatively easy. So also if you're an LP, you want to know who is the, because it's difficult sometimes. You might have a deal where there is about five and in some situations, 10, there's too many of them. So you need to figure out which one, who is the actual principal here. So it's important because they would play, play a major role in the trajectory of the deal. So next is the acquisition specialist. Okay, so I think that one is key because first, 
two things I feel like are super important. I mean, me, me and George go back and forth about who is the most important part of the team. I think acquisition specialist is, even though they are more replaceable in a way, I would say, right? Than so an, an asset manager, for example. You need one. You need a, a great one. So the best way to do this, obviously, is to talk to commercial brokers if you want to do commercial uh, real estate. If you want to do uh, single family, find a regular realtor. But you have to understand that in the beginning, right, you're going to be getting bottom of the barrel, right? <laughs> Most of the deals they'll send you might be foul, right? It will be something like $5 million is the asking. And then when you do the analysis, then it's going to be like $2.5 million. So it's too far off. But eventually though, as in you become more popular in the space and also you've shown them that you can close deals, you've shown your underwriting, they will start sending you, taking you more seriously and start getting better deals, okay? So when that starts to happen, it's better to pick, eventually pick one of these commercial brokers and either some people with um, syndicators will hire them, you know, in-house, but we choose to do more of a partnership with them. So you have that GP split, you could say, okay, if prioritize us in getting the deals, you also get to get that 10% or 15% of the acquisition, right? So that's a great in incentive for them to want to work hard, no, not just acquiring, even help with asset management, every part of the deal, because there's a situation. I just say this because oftentimes people feel like they have to just hire everything. And then you go bankrupt before your company even gets started. So try to partner as often as you can. And whenever you have the, the resources, obviously, you can always hire people in-house. So I'm going to let you give a, a pause for the judge to add in any questions. Yep. And so I mentioned it earlier, but you can actually outsource asset manager or you can have them in-house. You can have someone who specifically does that. That's their strength. That's their expertise. A lot of times the managing partner, the lead operator, again, we're throwing a lot of terms and definitions out there. They end up being the asset manager, but that is actually a specific skill within the team. That's somebody who develops and implements the asset management strategy. They're overseeing not only the property manager, so they're not actually in the operations of property management, but they're managing the manager, which is also very important. You can't just leave the keys to the whole thing to the property manager. Someone actually has to be watching them and making sure that the performance is, is going along according to the business plan. And yeah, that's part of their job. So they're also obviously thinking about the broader picture, not only the in the weeds. So they're the connection of both. They're watching the broad macro trends. They're looking at property operations. If there's construction involved, whether it's a value add or if it's a ground up development, now you need somebody managing the construction team, which is different than the property management team. And um, so uh, you need somebody kind of having that whole umbrella under their watch. So they're overseeing all of these aspects. Again, you can outsource it. Um, I think of the, the managing partner as the visionary and the asset manager um, can be that visionary too. It usually is because you almost have to have that broad range and scope to have your visions of the kind of company you want to raise and develop, but you can actually be very tactical as an asset management and just very good at what you're doing on a tactical level. So that's another aspect of the team. Then there's investor relations. That's the next one. This is someone who's connecting the capital from the limited partners or the passive investors to the deal. Cause there's one, there's two sides. There's the deal side, and then there's the capital side, and the, both have to come together to marry for, for the actual thing to work. And so you have someone who essentially is a marketing and sales expert. That's what investor relations does. They're also an educator. You get in front of people and teach them about these concepts such that they're, they're, they reach a level of confidence to invest either with you or with someone else. And so that's an investor relation. This is someone who's very personable, very um, engaging, putting puts out content, does one-on-one -on -one calls to, to get to know investors and allow investors to get to know the culture of the company. 
They're addressing investor inquiries. So they're keeping them updated. So there's a communication line too. So think about before and after an investment. Before an investment, they're educating and bringing them in. After an investment, you have LPs. You need to keep your communications up. You need to be updating them, letting them know about distributions, letting them know about different ongoings that are pertinent to them and what they care about as far as how the deal's going. Uh, this also a lot of times falls under the managing partner because they usually have that role, but they can you can still hire that out. You can get someone who specifically does that. And a lot of times that investor relations person, since they're so close to the investor, they're involved in the capital raising as well. So we never say somebody's only a capital raiser, but a lot of times those two job functions go hand in hand, investor relations and capital raisers. True. Yeah. And the next is legal. For we'll talk about that just a little bit early on, that you obviously need an SEC attorney. You also need a regular legal counsel, um, at least for general exposure for your company and yourself, right? So you need... The, so same thing, I'm going to actually pick it, go back a little bit. So when you first start any business, right, with all the books we, you know, we've read, you are everything at first. You're the visionary, you're the integrator, <laughs> you're the marketer, you're the everything, right? But as you grow, you can start deciding which one of these am I best at. So then you isolate that one as the one that you will continue to do mainly. Then which ones, like for example, I know how to underwrite, but I just don't want to do it. So it's tedious. So I would rather hire that out, right? Because of the, you know, it's time saving. And it's not that you might enjoy doing it. And my background is mathematics and I enjoy numbers, but it's just, a, it's taking you all day to underwrite like a couple of deals sometimes. Just I thought that. So with the legal counsel, it, of course it's, expensive in general, right? Even more expensive to bring one in-house, right? If you have to hire an actual lawyer that is just doing your own, your company, right? It's going to be expensive. So usually we do, for us right now, we do by deal by deal. So we have a bunch of syndicate attorneys and regular attorneys and we retain them for individual deals. It would still be nice to have uh, someone that look at all of it together all at once, rather than just deal this deal. Someone that look at 10 of the deals that you're doing together, look at the oil and gas plus self-storage plus multifamily, rather than in one attorney for this, one attorney for that. So, so yeah, so that's what I'll say about that. So, you know, they ensure compliance with security laws, uh, regulations, and there's a lot of disclosure, which we actually should say that this is only for informational purposes only. This, webinar. So that's one disclosure, right? They tell you that actually in some cases, they will review even the webinars. You should have people to review almost all of your documents coming out, especially if you're doing like five or six different five or six B, which means you can only invest in that kind of investment. You can only do family and friends. And there's a little bit of red tape on how you can advertise. And there are situations where we have something that we wanted to post and they will tell us, remove it right now or don't even think about it. So you need a legal counsel for sure. Okay. And then next you have your financial specialist. A lot of times you may hear the term underwriter. When, once you find uh, potential deals from your acquisitions person, someone has to underwrite it and go through financial modeling. That's specific, but that, that financial person has, since they have that financial mind, they're doing even more beyond that. They can do more beyond that. They can look at the financial analysis of not just the deal, but actually the market. So they can be on the macro level, looking at financial trends, seeing what rental comps look in the area, what economic growth, like median household income, looking at wage growth, looking at very broad macro trends and trickling and funneling that down to how that may impact the financial performance of a specific property. So they're doing financial data analysis, market trends, investment metrics. They're also looking at the funding as far as the lending, the capital stack. They're looking at different things like interest rates and cap rates. 
um, lending terms because that can look very different across different loan products. And so that all that goes into the underwriting spreadsheet and can get tweaked here and there to affect the, the projections of the specific deal. But even within the whole syndication company, you can have a financial specialist who looks at just the health of the company, the financial health and the cash flow projections of the entire company, not just the deal. So it's a lot of things that this financial person could do, but at specific deal level, they're doing a lot of underwriting and you can get a specific person to either do that in-house or you can, like we said, for some of these other positions, you can hire that out as a third party as well. Yeah. For underwriting specifically, you can, uh, I prefer to I outsource it. And also there are members of the team though, that actually like underwriting, like the acquisition manager, Josh, he loves underwriting because he's the acquisition guy. So he will send three deals a day sometimes with very nice, already underwritten deals. But when I first started, I was doing this, this till midnight, 2 a.m. in the morning, doing everything, wearing all the hats, which... You know, you might have to do that in the beginning, right? Until you get enough capital to to start hiring. So basically, like I said, identify the, you know, in order of importance, that's what I do. Like I have all this, that this is what I want to do at the end of the day, like asset management and probably a little bit of investor relations. That's my final level. <laughs> but every part eventually it will be hired out. But in the meantime, you can keep doing some of it, right? Until you can hire each one out. So you feel like, okay, underwriting was the first one to go. Then marketing, right? Which we're going to get to that later. So I'm going to go to the next one. Which I'll, is I'll add real quick, just from my LP experience, that I think even though underwriting it may be one of the most, I would say, foreign thing to most LPs, it's still something to get familiar with to some degree. Because as you evaluate deals, you need to at least look at a spreadsheet and just understand it. You may not necessarily know how to have to know how to build one or be savvy with manipulating and, and tweaking the numbers to do different projections, but at least just knowing how to read one at a basic level so you can evaluate deals. And so I think everyone on the GP team probably has at least that ability to look at underwriting, give their input. I do that a lot, even though, you know, I'm not making the models. I'll look at the underwriting and I'll know what I'm looking for to see if this looks like good underwriting or not. I wanted to add that piece just because underwriting is almost like a foreign language if you don't know Excel, you know, so. Yeah. And also there are a lot of good models out there now, right? Yep. So we use multiple different ones. We settled on my blank. Um, I'll give, I'm going to give a, a plug in to Justin Gooden. We've been trying out his underwriting model. He actually have a underwriting service now too. You see him on LinkedIn. He's very popular on LinkedIn. So you could, you don't have to make the Excel. Absolutely. <laughs> and, but you should, but you need to know how to analyze deals for sure. And I would say that for every single part of this, you know, in the beginning, you're doing everything. So you should learn. So for any business. You need to learn every aspect of the business before. Basically, you have to do it first before you actually hire it out. Because what if the underwriters give very false assumption? How are you going to know? So you need to, you know, uh, do it yourself first. Make sure that you're good and proficient. Then you can manage them, right? You're still going to be managing them, you know, correcting them over time until they become very good at what you're looking for. So for the so next is the due diligence coordinator. So this person, you know, coordinates the due diligence efforts, right? For acquisition. So and this includes inspection, financial audits, and legal reviews. So we take a little bit of shortcuts in this particular due diligence, is that this our main property manager is also the same person that does this due diligence. So because property managers, I think, are the best suited for this because they already know, you know, what they're looking for. They are most likely going to be the one to also manage a property. So what you can do when you find a property, especially when it's not close to you, is to interview at least, you know, maybe five property managers in the area, get referral, 
If you get referral, that would be easiest, right? If somebody already said, look, we have 300 units, we use these property managers and they're very good and look at our results. So saves you time and energy and you trust the person, obviously. Then, you know, the due diligence process, they charge you, hours charges between 100 bucks to $150 per for this. And then, so if it's hundred dollars, then you have to give that ten k, right? So you need to pay, and then they will do the anal analysis for you and take a look. They also manage timelines, right? Your documentation, communications with third party service provider. So there are some times where she would take a look at the property and said, you know what, this property is like nineteen seventy one. I will look at everything, we look at the pipes, they look okay, but we're not sure. Let us hire a, a plumber, someone specifically for this aspect. Or, oh, the roof looks good, but there's this aspect of it that I'm not certain. Let's get this roofer. So they will coordinate that, and it might be added cost for you, but it will be good for you to know that before you <laughs> lose millions of dollars, right? Anything else to add, George? Yeah, I want to add that bit about the property manager. Even though the due diligence is not necessarily the, the the realm of property management, it's good to involve property management early and even bring them on the due diligence piece. Um, that way, they can understand the the things you're not only you're looking for on you know any major deferred maintenance repairs that, but then you can also discuss like business plan. Because there's different caliber of, of property managers out there. And some of them may not understand that you're you have this syndication on this 200 unit and you've got LPs that you've brought on to invest alongside. And they are expecting different returns compared to if it's just maybe your own property. And Bio can speak to this where you don't necessarily want specific cash flows or looking for cash flows. You're just looking to really renovate and add value to all the units as fast as possible um, versus a slower business plan where you're slowly at, um, turning units and upgrading units. And therefore, the property manager should be involved early in this due diligence period to know your business plan as well, not just the renovations that need to be done, but understand, look, we need to get expenses down. We need to carry through these constructions and push rents and the property managers should have intimate knowledge about the, the market rents in that area. And so now they're becoming a, a strategic partner with the whole business plan. And not all property managers are savvy to working with investments and syndications. So you want to find one that, that understands syndications and the business plans that you usually see in syndications when there's other investors involved. Yeah, very good point. Because like I like you said, when I have my own properties, I don't focus on cash flow. My focus is more of equity. I really want to, you know, get it to the level to double my money as fast as possible. But if that means I put all the money back into it, so be it, right? Whereas, but you have to communicate that to your property manager. And most property managers, I'll say, they're used to just working with people, now, with just you buying your own deals and not so much with investors, especially at the lower level, like below 75 units. They're used to someone, it's just your property, so they manage it differently. The communication, right? For example, in uh, our syndications, every single week, we need to have rent roll, we need to have all the data, right? <laughs> and then we we'll go come to it and then we we'll read it and then we we'll meet with them and then we we'll put it all together for the end of the month to email investors. Whereas if it's my own personal deal, I can just talk on the phone, right? <laughs> and be like, okay, how many is empty? What's, what's the occupancy? Okay, we're 95%, good. See you next month. So it, it's a world to, to different. So and that, you know, is some property managers are not used to showing up every week, you know, going on a call with 10 people or five people and giving being accountable. So, and I actually do think you should try to do that on your own deals too. I try to do it as much as I can 
maybe not as frequent, like every week, maybe every other week, to actually have a one hour mandatory sit down with them. So anyways, I know we already called, we called by the property manager with the due diligence. The, to us, it's very similar, almost. However, you can also hire a third party. I don't actually have one on top of my head, but there are people that can just do just due diligence. You hire them, they come in, do the due diligence, give you the report, and get out of the deal. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how there's actually third party for pretty much everything. And there's obviously pros and cons to third party versus in-house, but everything that we've talked about so far is pretty much third party. You can even hire a CEO. <laughs> you can be a super visionary and just literally hire us to go run the whole thing. So that's pretty interesting. Definitely the next topic is something that that probably should be hired out unless you have that specific skill set. And that's the marketing department, the marketing manager. Again, I think this kind of intertwines with investor relations, but to be honest, Marketing is such important and intricate. It's like a science, <laughs> consumer yeah. psychology, right? Yeah. Marketing and sales. And there are people who are just, they're just, they have this like on another level and I'm learning about it so much right now, but a marketing personnel, a marketing team, they can really maximize your exposure when you're trying to generate leads, particularly for getting investors. So they're doing different kind of funnel nurturing campaigns they're creating branding, they're creating positioning, they're doing social media content to create presence. So all of this is like really important. They're helping organize webinars, being able to really connect. They help you connect with your avatar, which is like the target demographic that you feel like you can resonate with the most. Because really the game is not to try to capture everyone. It's actually to be very niched and you need specific strategies based on science, honestly based on psychology of how to attract that specific demographic. So it can be hired out, usually working very closely with either the investor relations person, the capital raisers, the managing partner. Yep, I agree with I am now. Obviously, it gets expensive very quick. For example, I was going with George about spending what market out like 2000 a month, then another one, 20, about 2500 a month. And then you run the ads, which is another couple of thousands a month. Before you know it, you're spending like over 100K, right? And then you have to hire a virtual assistant to coordinate all of this. Of course, you should graduate this as you grow, right? At first, I was posting my own social media. Of course, I wasn't really getting, well, I wasn't, wasn't getting the likes and the, because it's still something out there. So that, that's in our GP course. In the one-on-one -on -one that we do with men mentees, the first week, you should start your branding and positioning. And you need to learn how to at least post, <laughs> do what is what works for different social media. And then once you start getting some income, you know, in, then you can outsource this. You know, I don't want this to sound overwhelming also to be like, man, I need to hire all these people. If you only have one deal or two deals, you could probably still run it many of these part of the syndication company. But as you get to 10 deals, it's going to be difficult to continue to capture more emails, do one-on-ones, right? And then go and post on social media. And then you post on multiple social medias and then reply to comments and DMs. <laughs> it, it gets uh, tough very quickly. And, so, and the key thing is, like Bio said, to do this, like at one, one of your first steps, because... You really want to start that process before you even have a deal. So you avoid the whole cold call effect. <laughs> you want your audience who your prospects to, who are going to potentially invest with you. You want them to know you even before you have the deal. You want them to be comfortable, know and trust you as opposed to feeling like you're just now here with a deal and they don't even know you. That's just, it's harder to raise and connect with people that way. So I'm going to answer a page while bio goes to the next one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And then the next one on my list is actually property manager, which we kind of already talk about. Basically, oversees the day-to-day -day operations of the syndicated properties, right? And they also manage uh, lease agreements, property maintenance, and three things you want to really optimize: occupancy, income, and the value. So sometimes some of these does not go in line with each other. Sometimes, right? 
sometimes, you know, if you try to optimize occupancy too much, then, you know, you might end up decreasing your price, right? You might have to do so many concessions. And if you want to get the rental income too high, then you lose some people to <laughs> that because of too high income. So it's just a balancing act overall. And for me, the most important thing really is the property value. And if you just know that this is where we want to get to, and slowly you raise the rent up to that level, even if it takes three years to do, and you're going to be able to get, because when you think about distribution, so let's say you invest 100K, and oftentimes the distribution is maybe 8, 8% on a good day, right? So even at the end of five years, you only got $40,000 so the real money is at the end when you sell. That's where the 70-30 split happens. And that's where the real money happens. Yes, it's good to distribute so that people know that the property is doing well and, and we're making income. But sometimes you might have to sacrifice some of that to for the better benefit of improving the value of the property. Let's say you need to do a renovation and, and you say, okay, we're going to hold distribution for two quarters to do this innovation, which will high, give us higher rent. It's probably better for you to do so, right? Uh, to increase the property value. So, so yeah, so you need to, a property manager that understand this because um, it's a balancing act also, you know, for you to be an asset manager, right? As an asset manager, oftentimes, we, it, it's an argument between you and the property manager because property manager is going to tell you this is how to do it. This is how we do it. And you have to be like, no, but this is what we want to achieve. <laughs> so you just have to find someone that agrees with, you know, knows where you're going and also also challenges your, you know, your notion because yes, I didn't want to do a promotion, for example. I'm like, no promotion, you know, never did a promotion on any, any of my own personal properties. I would get it rented. But for, but for the, a larger property, and they're like, you need to do a little bit of promotion. And then, so and that's something that we end up listening to them, and then it worked out. So, and the last one is the construction manager, and which is basically someone that coordinates your construction projects. This... You don't have to hire this in-house either. What we end up doing is I have my own personal properties. I have 62 units of my own, and I already have a construction crew that kind of help with those. So, and they give like inputs, even if they're not going to be the one to end up renovating the syndication projects, they at least give, give some ideas and help coordinate because they've been with us. They've been with me for five years, six years. So they understand me, they understand my thinking, but oftentimes everything's about money, right? You have to give, pay them like maybe 10% or, or 15% of the value of the construction. So if you're constructing for $1 million, you then have to pay them another 100K to oversee that. Anything we miss? And just as a bonus, the external, some external key members of the team is obviously accounting team. You want somebody keeping the books, doing taxes, tax prepare, maximizing your deductions, all your business write-offs. An asset protection team, you want to have the right entities set up. There's ways you can structure your entities such that your ent asset protection team is working well with your tax preparer, maximizing your uh, deductions. And then brokers, they help find deals uh, in, in, in conjunction with your acquisitions. Um, personnel. So this is external. These are just broker companies. You get to know them by networking and then they bring you deals. You got to think of almost all of these folks as people who could end, end up bringing you good deals. And that reminds me, I didn't put, but lenders, obviously huge partners, your biggest capital partner is going to be your lender and they can oftentimes bring you deals as well. So you got to nurture those relationships and make sure you have people that, you know, like not just some random lenders, but you get to actually know them on a fairly close basis so that they're bringing you deals, giving you best terms, helping you out in a pinch, which is that's what's happening a lot right now 
a lot of the syndicators who have the best relationships with their lenders, they're able to work out deals now that these interest rates have gone up and a lot of these deals are stressed and strain to the point of foreclosure. If you have a good lending relationship, you can work out different terms to help salvage the deals. Even though they're not internal, they're still part of your team. They need to be considered as part of your team. Absolutely. That's actually very important because like especially the local lenders, they are much nicer, but the problem is the interest rate is higher. And that's lesson that I learned along the way is you know, there's been deals where the difference will be like 7% and 7.2%. And your best, in your mind, you're like, man, I need to go for that 7%. Because when I put it into the calculator, it looks so nice. The cash on cash return is now 7.5 instead of 7. <laughs> but but you want to go with someone, a lender that can, first of all, can close the deal. Because we've had a deal in the past where the lender end up increasing the interest rate in the middle of a deal because of the committee. There was like a tiny bit to put notes of pending on the committee review, which normally doesn't happen. But if you know the lender, you usually shake on it. And I'm like, I got this, I got this rate, right? The rate is good. It's like, I'm going to push it through. And if you run into trouble, they give you versus agency loan, right? We talked about agency loan last time. You miss, you go below 90% occupancy, 85% occupancy, they send you a letter. <laughs> and they might actually threaten to take away the deal from you versus a local lender where they see it happening they see you using your reserve to do a little bit of renovation and they will just you know you talk it out with them and they're more lenient so yes it's important to find a good lender the cheapest or the lowest rate may not always be the best so just make a balance and we have a question how did you vet and find construction manager? So first, referral for everything is the number one. That's in general. The syndication, in, in the world of syndication, a very small world in terms of if I need somebody, something in Houston, I call judge, judge calls somebody else, <laughs> somebody else calls somebody else. And usually before you know it, you have a list of people that they work with and they can show proof that they did well. That's probably the best. If you can't, it's going to be, uh, for me, I went to try an error for my own personal property. I did a construction, a 10 units that I, <laughs> I talk about a lot, that the project actually got shut down twice by, an, by a city inspector because he was doing plumbing by himself and then he got caught <laughs> doing it, you know, so he just... You know, when chaotic, of course, you're not, going to, you're not going to use that. And if somebody asks you, I'm like, no, do not use this guy. So you go to try and error ultimately. But if you can get a very good referral source, and I think it's relatively easy to get referrals. You just ask which market. We probably have someone in every market, a syndicator right now that we could reach out to. So just let us know. The only problem you might run into is if your book project is too small, you might have trouble also getting a good construction manager, right? If your deal is like a single family, there's not a lot of meat on the bone. It's going to be tough. So you end up using like a maintenance guy. <laughs> so you end up, for my small life deals, that's what ends up happening. Because none of the bigger, they want to work on it. You're going to make, you be like, you're going to make $5,000 on this project. They're like, no, I'm good. So as far as any... where to find them, I feel like you find general contractors attending a lot of these networking events. So local meetup, not saying that they're legit versus good quality. You have to still vet them with word of mouth mostly, but at least they'll show up to these events because they want to pass out their cards. So you can start mingling with them at meetups, at conventions, at conferences. That's one way to do it. Yeah. And uh, anybody have any questions, you can come up. There's not a lot of us, so you can come up and ask questions, give input, have your own team member for the next yeah, so, uh I've got a question for you. Are you guys uh, hosting any web uh, seminars or anything, live sessions? We're, we don't have any, like, meetup, in-person meetup sessions. This has been our main kind of connection, okay. education, 
but we do have a coaching program and that's starting to get rolled out right now. We do anticipate that will eventually lead to some live events, but that's not in the near future. That may be some more time off, but nothing like in live, in-person events, live events. Okay. All right. We, we do, I don't know if Judge is still doing it. Uh, we started off doing local meetings. And so we I added it every single month for about a year and a half. And now I'm moving mine to every quarter or so, where we just have a local, just local events, talking about a topic, you know, and it's good. It's important too. If you want to do syndication, you want to be a GP to at least let people know you locally by doing that. But we don't have it where people come from. Georgia came to mine and I went to George's <laughs> one in the past. And we got some, maybe one or two people that came, especially to George, because George lives in the, in Houston, living in a better, I live in Fort Smith, Arkansas. So you have to line up the airport and drive another hour. So it's, 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 it's tougher. So, but yeah. But Houston is that big. It's, it's, it's the same thing. You land at the airport, you still got to drive an hour to get to Houston. <laughs> I guess I didn't come in that way. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah, no, you're, yeah. I used to host a in-person meetup as well an actual a, a lower key one. I hope to get to back to it, but as of right now, it's still something that is more in the future. In-person meetups are very invaluable. So I look to get back to that at some point, something monthly or quarterly as well. Okay. Do you have anything in San Antonio, James? I do not, but I'm working toward that. I've got yep. a small group of folks here that we meet periodically. It's not on a regular schedule or anything, but I'm trying to I'm trying to grow that that uh, position and start having something. I, I like the idea of the quarterly, so we're looking forward to that. But is I, but I also am part of a couple of other groups as well. Most of that activity is an annual meeting where we all congregate in one city somewhere. Or, or through webinars. Yeah. Let us know. Keep us posted. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to get to a point where I've been somewhat quiet about my activity in this market, but I'm, I'm fastly realizing that I need to get my social media up and running. So I'm working with some different tools I'm trying to develop and but I'm fastly finding that, finding out that's taking more of my time than what it necessarily needs to be. I need to be focusing on bringing deals or getting deals. I've sent out a query for VAs. I'll see how, how that works out. But yeah, Obey will say you start out and I've been doing this. I've been in real estate since the early 90s, but I started multifamily uh, during COVID. Um, I, I got sent home from my government job to work from home, which I couldn't do because of what I did. Um, <laughs> so I, two years into that, they decided, okay, it's time to come back to work. And I went, nah, I think I like it home. I got into the multifamily and there's a group of us that are doing syndications and we've done very well over the past four years since COVID. So from 2020 to, to now. We didn't do much. We did one deal last year in Texarkana, Arkansas, but that was the only thing that we could find the underwrite that actually made sense. But with current economic conditions changing, the interest we're looking at interest rates coming down, potentially a point. Hopefully that happens sometime between now and June time frame. That's going to make things a lot better. I'm highly um, alert on these on these properties that were bought during COVID that didn't get bought the right way. So they've got those low interest mortgages that are assumable. So I'm really hyped on finding those, looking for those. I got the one that um, I was telling you about up in Dallas. It was it was 4.3% uh, assumable, I think. I got another one I'm looking at. It's, it's 4.2, I believe. I'm still looking at the financials on it. So... We'll see how that goes. My mentors say in this environment, the debt becomes the asset. <laughs> yeah. This year should be, pro I'm, should be promising this year. It le really looks like it's going to be an investor's year. I'm really stoked about it. Yeah. For sure. I'll get it. 
it's very smart that you slow down, right? So that's the thing. You know, if you see people doing five deals, ten deals last year, yeah. you already know that they're they they <laughs> some of those are gonna we're gonna be buying it in a few years time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So most people slow down. I mean, we also end up doing like one major deal. I'm uh, actually two, like December twenty eighth, literally. Yeah. At the yeah. end of the year, we barely, barely made the second one. So yeah. yeah, that's what it is. But well, yeah. So well, in respect of everyone's time, so we're gonna end the webinar here, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks' time for another episode. And uh, we're still working on inviting guests. And if you have any topic that you'd like to hear, email us. Let us know. Great. Excellent. So thank you guys. Bye. Have a great night, everyone.